Good evening, everyone. I'm Saurabh Paliwal from Biocon Investor Relations team. And I would like to welcome you to Biocon's earnings call for Q2 FY24. I would like to indicate that all participants will be in the listen-only mode, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude. Should you need to raise questions, please raise your please use the raise hand option under the reactions tab of the Zoom application. We will call out your name and unmute your line to enable you to ask the question. While asking, please begin with your name and your organization. Please note that the chat box is disabled, but you can raise any technical concerns by sending us an email to investor.relations at biocon.com. I would like to bring to your attention that this conference call is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the website within a day, and the transcript will be made available subsequently. Today, to discuss this quarter's business performance and future outlook for the company, we have Dr. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, our executive chairperson, Mr. Peter Baines, Group CEO, Mr. Siddharth Mittal, MD and CEO Biocon Limited, Mr. Shihas Tambe, MD and CEO Biocon Biologics, along with other senior management colleagues across our business segments. Before we begin, I would like to point out to everyone the safe harbor related to today's call. Comments made during this call may be forward-looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. They must be viewed in relation to the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. After the end of this call, if you need any further information or clarifications, please do get in touch with the team. With this, I would like to turn the call over to our chairperson for her opening remarks. Over to you, Kiran. Thank you, Saurabh, and good evening, everyone. Let me begin by wishing everyone a very happy Dhanterash and a very, very happy and prosperous Diwali. Let me wish you all health, happiness, and prosperity in your in your homes and let's hope that the year ahead is going to be very prosperous for all of us and for our country. I would now like to provide you with a broad overview of the group financials. Total revenue for the quarter was 3,620 crores up 52% year on year. Revenue from operations increased by 49% year on year to 3,462 crores with biosimilars revenue almost doubling, of course, reflecting the acquisition from Biatris. Research services delivered a strong revenue growth of 18% while generics grew by a modest 4%. Core EBITDA grew by 35% to 1,100 crores, reflecting a healthy core operating margin of 32%. Let me now introduce two senior executive appointments. Mr. Kedar Upadhyay, who joined Biocon Biologics as the new CFO. Kedar brings over 23 years of global financial leadership in the pharmaceutical industry. His deep experience and expertise will enhance our ability to unlock and drive future value in Biocon Biologics. Secondly, I would like to welcome back Mr. Peter Baines, who, as you know, assumed the role of Group CEO uh, of the Biocon Group in September. Peter will be responsible for supporting me in evolving strategy and driving synergies between the three group companies. And this is with an aim to maximize their combined value for all stakeholders. Peter's comprehensive understanding of the Biocon group coupled with his extensive global leadership experience and successful track record across the biopharmaceutical sector will enable us to capitalize on the shared value of our three businesses and add impetus to the group's growth trajectory. On that note, and as a part of Peter's new role, I would like to hand over the floor to Peter, who will lead the earnings calls going forward. Over to you, Peter. 
Thank you, Kieran, and good evening, everybody. And let me first of all say how delighted I am to be rejoining Biocon. It's a real privilege and pleasure, and I'm very excited to be rejoining the group at such an exciting and dynamic stage of its evolution. Before discussing business performance, I want to take this opportunity to welcome other new leadership hires in the group. In Biocon Biologics, we have three appointments. Dr. Uwe Gudat joins as the Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Arlene Wolny joins as Global Head of Regulatory Affairs. And Mr. Ramprasad Bhatt joins as Head of Branded Formulations in India. And at Biocon Limited, Mr. Nitin Tiwari has been appointed as the Head of Quality for the generic business. Let me now expand on Kiran's um, opening view on the uh, performance for the quarter. As Kiran stated, total revenue and core EBITDA for the quarter were 3,620 and 1,100 core respectively. R&D spends for Q2 stood at 264 core as compared to 242 core last year corresponding to 10% of revenues excluding Sinjin. The R&D investments are largely attributable to advancing BBL's strong pipeline of biosimilar molecules, as well as developing new peptides with a focus on GLP-1s in our generic business. The benefits of these investments in research and development are expected to play out in the coming years. EBITDA for the quarter was up 68% at 900 crore versus 535 crore last year, with an EBITDA margin of 25% as compared to 22% last year. Depreciation, amortization, and interest increased by 376 crore over last year, primarily related to the biosimilar business acquisition costs. Consequently, profit before tax and exceptional items stood at 238 crore, marginally down from last year. Net profit for the quarter before exceptional items stood at 142 crore as compared to 168 crore in the previous year. Exceptional items during the quarter amounted to 16 crore, net of tax and minority interest. These relate to the reversal of production-linked incentive scheme accruals of the last fiscal consequent to the cap on annual claim allocation, as well as transaction cost of the proposed Stellis facility acquisition by Synergy. Exceptional items last year amounted to 122 crore, and therefore reported net profit stands at 126 crore as compared to 47 crore last year. Let me now turn to discuss the generic business segment performance. Generics reported an operating revenue of 676 crore for the quarter, a growth of 4% over the same, same period last fiscal. Core EBITDA margin for the quarter stood at 23%, with profit before tax at 66 crore, representing a profit before tax margin of 10%. Revenue performance for the quarter was driven by continued traction in the US generic formulation business through additional volumes in statins and recently launched products and most of the world market expansion. On the API side, performance was muted due to phasing of supplies because of a planned maintenance shutdown for one of our key products, as well as pricing pressures. We made two significant announcements during the quarter. First, we announced a partnership agreement with Juno Pharmaceuticals, a specialty pharmaceutical company in Canada for the commercialization of liraglutide for the treatment and management of type two diabetes and obesity in Canada. And secondly, as part of our plans to strengthen our foothold in the North American market, Biocon acquired the oral solid dosage U.S. manufacturing facility of Iowa Pharma, located in New Jersey. The acquisition of this U.S. FDA-approved facility, our first in the U.S., 
will strategically enhance and complement Biocon's existing manufacturing capabilities. The facility will enable the immediate addition of oral solid dose capaci capacities for new products earlier than planned and ensure continuity of supply through the diversification of our manufacturing infrastructure. The facility's employees have transitioned to Biocon and the process of qualifying the site for some of our products has already been initiated. We are pleased to see positive outcomes on the regulatory front with several generic formulation approvals obtained in the quarter, one in the US, two in Europe, and four products in most of the world markets. Further to this, we've received two API product approvals, each in the United States and in Europe. Regarding our capital expenditure program, we crossed an important milestone in the quarter with process validation at the company's Greenfield Immunosuppressant API facility in Visa Campathan, which is now successfully completed. We now expect commercial supplies to begin in uh, full year 25, post qualification of the site by global regulators. This new capacity for immunosuppressants will enable us to diversify our manufacturing footprint and address the growing demand for these products globally. In the second half of the year, we see a mix of both opportunities and challenges. On the generic formulation side, we expect a sustained performance supported by a gradually improving environment in the US market. On the API side, we anticipate some recovery. However, pricing pressure and higher inventory stocking at our customers could impact offtake. The recent and successful outcomes from inspection of two of our sites by the US FDA reiterates our commitment to quality excellence as we continue to work on strengthening our mid to long-term proposition with increased investments in portfolio, R&D capabilities and infrastructure to, de to deliver on our strategic plans. Moving now to uh, Biocon Biologics. Let me start by providing an update on the transition of the acquired business from Viatris to Biocon Biologics. Our accelerated integration plan has been progressing well. In addition to the 70 emerging markets transitioned in July, we have now fully completed the integration of the North America business resulting in seamless commercial operations in the region from September the 1st. We remain on track to transition the business in Europe, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, and the remaining emerging market countries later during the year, which will complete the integration of the acquired business. The transition and in integration of the two businesses is a critical milestone in our journey as it enables the most important strategic rationale of the acquisition, and that is the creation of a globally scaled and fully vertically integrated lab-to-market biosimilar enterprise. Turning now to the business performance and starting with the United States, we continue to see good momentum across our oncology and our insulins portfolio. Fulfiller, our biosimilars Pegfil Grastin market share, has grown to 19% in September versus 11% last year. Market share for Aguivri, our biosimilar Trastuzumab, stands at 12% versus 10% last year. We continue to add new customers for these products. A large benefit provider covering 100 million lives has added Ogivri and Fulfiller to their 2024 medical drug lists, enabling further market share growth in the coming year. Market share for our insulin glargine is at 11% in September. The volume supplied through a large managed care network contract not captured in these market shares is over and above the IQVIA data. Furthermore, starting in January and January the 1st, 2024, we have added two large payers to our insulin glargine customer base, which should help further enhance our market share. These strong market performances of our products demonstrate the commercial capability of our US team. 
and continued addition of new customers for these products enables volume growth, accommodating for price erosion. Turning now to Adilumab, the market adoption of biosimilars has very clearly been slower than anticipated across the market. And of course, this has also affected Julio, our biosimilar Adalilumab. Notwithstanding these early market dynamics, our focus remains on expanding market access to drive adoption. We remain engaged with customers to add our product to their formularies. And I'm pleased to share that our product has been enlisted with the commercial standard opt-out formulary of a large purchasing organization and corresponding managed Medicaid business, covering over 8 million lives. It has also been added to the national preferred formulary for Medicaid members, one of the largest Medicaid managed care organizations, covering 7 million lives. Turning now to Europe, our products continue to make steady gains. The market share of Fulfiller has grown to 8% against 5% last year. And Abevmi, our biosimilar Bevacuzumab, has grown to 7% against 1% last year. Julio continues to have market shares of 18% and 11% in Germany and France, respectively. As we complete the transition of the business in Europe to a single fully integrated model, we see the potential to improve business performance. In emerging markets, Biocon Biologics remains on a steady growth trajectory supported by continuing strong demand for insulins. We continue to increase the depth and breadth of our emerging market franchise. In quarter two, there were four new launches and 11 new approvals laying the foundation for future growth. Aligning with our global product focus, we announced the divestment of two non-core branded formulations, uh, India business units in dermatology and nephrology to Iris Life Science, Iris Life Science for 366 core, representing a revenue multiple of around 4%. Now coming to the financials of Biocon Biologics. On a sequential basis, we have seen revenues marginally down by 2% at 1,969 core, despite significantly lowering licensing revenues versus last year. Excluding these licensing revenues, Sequential growth stands at 6%, reflecting the underlying positive performance of our commercial products. This is translated into a core EBITDA of 660 core with margins at 34% in line with our mid 30s guidance. EBITDA margin for the quarter was 23% with R&D investments at 11% of revenues. Profit before tax stands at negative 15 core, driven by an increase of 35 core in depreciation, amortization, and interest costs. PBT is expected to improve with future growth in revenue. Now moving on to regulatory updates. The European Commission has granted marketing authorization in the European Union for Yesophily, our biosimilar aflibacept indicated for macular degeneration and diabetic ret retinopathy. As per IQVIA, Aflibacept had EU brand sales of approximately $1.8 billion last year. The US FDA has issued a CRL for the BLA of our insulin aspart, which did not identify any outstanding scientific issues with the product, and references the requirement for satisfactory resolution of deficiencies from the pre-inspection approval, uh, pre-approval inspection of our Malaysia facility. Separately, the FDA conducted a CGMP inspection of the Malaysia facility in July 2023, leading to observations primarily related to enhancing operational procedures and strengthening training programs. We are fully engaged with the agency to resolve all outstanding concerns. In summary, we are pleased with the accelerated progress in transitioning the acquired business and with the growth in market share of our commercialized products. While there has been delay in the activation 
of our immediate near-term catalysts, biosimilars adilumab, aspart, and bevacuzumab, these remain to be future growth drivers. And beyond these, and reflecting the strength of the Biocon Biologics pipeline, other future growth catalysts, including biosimilars to aflibacep, ustekinumab, denosumab, represent total original sales opportunities of $25 billion in, uh, in sales. Turning now to novels, um, and on the novel side, Bicara recently presented updated and positive interim data from its ongoing open-label phase 1, 1B dose expansion study of BCA 101 at the European Society for Medical Oncology, ESMO Congress. There was strong investigator interest uh, um, shown for, the, for these data. And Bicara is now well positioned to execute on its next round of funding, advancing BCA 101 and progressing its pipeline. To remind you, Bicara had announced a US dollar 108 million Series B financing earlier this year, which is being realized in a staged manner. Because of this, during the quarter, we recorded a step up gain of 75 core in the consolidated PL statement. Turning now to research services. Revenue from operations for the quarter was up 18% to 910 crore over last year. Reported EBITDA was up 19% to 276 crore with an EBITDA margin of 30%. Profit before tax was up uh, at 158 crores, 22% over last year. The performance during the second quarter was bolstered by strong performance in development and manufacturing services and supported by sustained momentum in the dedicated centers. In manufacturing services, Sinjin continued to make good progress on the long-term biologics manufacturing partnership with Zoetis. So coming now to some concluding remarks, and I think that overall, we are very pleased with the progress the group has made in the quarter. Biocon Biologics is on track with its, its accelerated transition program to create a fully integrated and globally scaled leading biosimilars enterprise. This will advance our ability to leverage the benefits of the fully integrated model and to expand our footprint in the United States, in Europe, and the most of the world markets in addressing the growing global demand for biosimilar products. The sustained momentum we've seen in the market share gains with our commercialized products in the United States and Europe as we complete the transition demonstrates the effectiveness of our commercial engine. As well as driving currently commercialized product, products, this provides a strong foundation for our future as we look to bring to market a rich pipeline with new product launches planned almost every year through to 2030. Finally, and looking ahead to the full year, we remain on track to deliver 1 billion revenue for Biocon Biologics, mid-teen constant currency growth in Syngene, and an improved second half performance in generics. That concludes my opening remarks. And before I hand over the floor to questions, let me end by wishing everybody a very happy Diwali and all the very best for the year ahead. May I now turn the floor over to questions. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll wait for the question queue to assemble. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Please uh, raise your uh, ra use the raise hand icon in the Zoom application, uh, and then we will uh, take uh, the questions once the queue is assembled.
First question for this evening is from Dhaval Bhalodia. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, hi, and good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, Dhaval Bhalodia. Um, I have the question regarding the U.S. biosimilar uh, industry landscape. Uh, currently, there is a um, uh, three largest PBM and, and specialty pharmacy holder majority share in the biologic product market. Um, and our brand Julio is one of the formulary and one of these largest PBM. Um, however, this particular PBM is planning to introduce their own biosimilar brand in collaboration with Sandoz. So given this competitive landscape, I'm curious to understand the strategic approach we are adopting. Um, could you please shed some light on the what strategy we are implementing to navigate this competitive environment um, and how we anticipate the sale of uh, our Julio brand uh, to fare in the year 2024? Uh, Peter? Oh. Yeah, you asked, do you want to take that? Yeah, thanks, Peter. I think, uh, thank you, uh, Dawal, for the question. And I think uh, between Matt and me, we'll, we'll respond to your uh, your question. Maybe, Matt, you can start and then I can add to this. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, sure, Shriyas. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I think, you know, as we continue to watch the involvement in this whole biosimilar industry as it relates to adalidumab in our Julio product, um, this is a, a significant, what I would call change, but one in which it's not the full portion of everything that we see in the market and the opportunities. This is a position in which a large payer has taken, but it's still playing out. What we've seen is them announcing this. Uh, we have not seen the large player now start looking at all formularies, both commercial and non-commercial formularies. So we continue to look at our biologics and our platform in regards to the total market itself as it relates to adalidumab and Julio. And we're seeing good progression in what we call low cost sensitive payers. And so just because they've announced this on the commercial side, um, does it limit us to playing in the rest of the full market? So we're going to continue to watch how this plays out with um, the company you mentioned and the uh, third party that they have set up. Uh, we have been in active discussions with them. Uh, we do understand exactly how this market is shaping up. And I think, you know, in my opinion, um, you know, it's something that we need to continue to uh, focus on, but not something that would limit us to the rest of the market uh, as we go through this. And remember, biosimilars, uh, it's just not an exclusive. Uh, most of the payers will be be looking at this, uh, uh, we believe going forward in a situation where they won't have just one biosimilar once the uh, Humira, when the payers decide what they're going to do and release this, we believe the market will reopen up again and there'll be opportunities no matter what uh, certain uh, payers or partnerships are looking like. So we may positive uh, for the future and how we're looking at our products, especially our Julio uh, products. So. I'll uh, turn it over to you, Srihas, for some additional comments. Thanks, uh, Matt. I think the only point I'll add to uh, what Matt said was, uh, the you know, these are strategies that payers will come up with, and I think we will respond to these as uh, as the market progresses. Just want to point out that you know the payer that you referred to also has formularies outside of commercial, and uh, those would be in the managed Medicare space and the Medicaid space, and you've seen our product being listed on those. So you will see outside of the particular collaboration that you pointed out, payers, the same payer making selections depending on, on what prioritizes their decisions on those formularies. So as Matt said, we you know we are aware of these things and we, we remain uh, in connection and contact with customers uh, engaged in seeing how these decisions are made. Thank you. Uh, and my second question is, uh, you know, there is a, a couple of uh, concerns recently come out due to the current environment. Uh, the firstly, with, uh, you know, the 85% of the price erosion on the, bio, on the bio, biosimilar product compared to the brand, 
in case of the Julio, uh, in case of the Humira, and secondly, the higher interest cost uh, on our current debt in the prevailing high interest rate environment. So I just want to check. Um, I know this is a current, uh, you know, just recently came up. This was this was not the case at the time of the Beatrice acquisition. But I just want to check the if this negative factor was adequately considered or factor in into the decision making process uh, during the Beatrice acquisition. Um, and um, it would be helpful to know if our current debt has a whether fixed or floating interest rate structure. Uh, and if we, we hedge our interest rate exposure to, uh, for our debt. Thank you. Um, th thank you for the question there. I think perhaps, uh, again, Sri has if, if you'd like to address the first question and maybe Sid, you can address the question on, um, on interest rates or oh, Chini. Yeah, I think Chini can address that as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the uh, the question double is very valid. I think from the time we've announced the um, the Beatrice acquisition back in February of twenty two, obviously things have changed and interest rates have revised overall. Uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, even in his opening remarks, we've uh, we've seen uh, Adelimo map behave differently in terms of the slower ramp up than expected. We had obviously guided for a for a slower 2023 with with pickup beginning in 24 and 25 being the the real opportunity things will probably play out uh, in that manner but 23 has uh, been slower than what we had initially planned so to that extent you're right the things have moved a little bit but the opportunity remains intact and uh, you know this moves by a couple of quarters into 2024 uh, to the, your question on on what these interest rates have been and how they've moved, I'll defer to Chini. Chini, do you want to take that up? Yeah, hi. Uh, so as far as uh, uh, the 1.2 billion loan is concerned, we had kept uh, one third open to allow for early prepayment. One third has been hedged and uh, one third is open for the interest rate movements. So that's how we managed the so it One. provides for enough flexibility to accommodate for uh, for how we're moving forward, Tawil, if that's what you're looking for. Oh, okay, that's it only for my side. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, Tawil. The next question is from Yashtana. Yeah, uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so my question, sir, I'm trying to understand the uh, PBT number for Biocon Biologics. So last quarter, we said that there is a one of uh, uh, 15 million expense uh, due to the legacy contracts. And uh, before that, I mean, if I add that back, uh, and in Q4, uh, I we did about 150 crores. So uh, I'm not uh, able to understand, even with a 35, 35 crores increase Q1, Q, uh, uh, the the number on the PBT uh, uh, side. Again, I think that's a Srihas Chini. Uh, Chini, why don't we explain this uh, to Yash and then we'll walk him through. I think we've had a healthy performance on the business and and how the PBT is impacted. Uh, maybe you can explain that. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, as you notice that there's been a strong improvement in our core EBITDA performance for the quarter. We've moved from 513 crores to 660 crores. With the EBITDA is kind of flat at the 450 mark, 457 in Q1 and 453 in Q2. And that's largely because Q1 had a benefit of licensing income, which played out and that helped improve the core EBITDA. Uh, sorry, improved the EBITDA for the quarter. This quarter, you've seen strong sales performance, uh, no licensing income or meaningful licensing income, and EBITDA is back up at 450 despite no licensing income. And as I indicated earlier, the strong performance at the core EBITDA line. When you go to the PBT line, we've kind of moved from plus 24 to minus 15, and that's largely because of the increased amortization cost consequent to the launch of the of Julio or Biosimilar Dalimumab in the US. So the, there's a need step up or increase in the amortization charge. 
Oh, so got it. And my second question uh, is relating uh, to the uh, growth, at least in the near to mid term, uh, with uh, observations on the Malaysian facility. Uh, as part, I believe, uh, is not. Uh, are we uh, anticipating this? Uh, for FI uh, 24 and if not, uh, how, how are we planning to uh, grow above the 1 billion base that we had target that we had set out, uh, you know, at the start of the year? Uh, let me respond to that. Yeah, sure. I think uh, from an, from an, from ASPART perspective, I think the development has been uh, positive in terms of the engagements that we've had with the agency and, and we will be uh, in active engagement with the FDA early next year. So once we have clarity on what exactly it is that they expect you to do, we will be able to give you more color in terms of when that opportunity utilizes, whether it is early 24 or it's later. But I think it's uh, it's important to see what the growth drivers were when we began the year. We exited uh, Q4 uh, of last fiscal with an exit run rate of a uh, billion dollars. And we were looking to grow that business uh, with the growth drivers, uh, particularly driven from the commercial products. And as you heard in Peter's opening remarks, almost all, or not almost, all of our products have grown in market share over last year. So one of the most reassuring things is in the major geographies, both in the US and in Europe now, we're seeing very strong growth in all our commercial products. Now, as U.S. still moves on with this um, uh, approvals with the FDA, one of the important things for commercial products is we've got seven products approved in the EU. And uh, Adelimumab and, uh, has done well in Germany and France, but we have a lot of headroom in the other products where we could go, grow from the base that we've got. And we're starting to see that with Bevacizumab, which has moved from a low base of 1% to 7%. And we're starting to see that in other products as well. So clearly there's an opportunity to grow from the base that we exited last, last year, last fiscal, to where we are now. We also do um, look forward to the uh, opportunities with Julio, like uh, Matt said, we haven't given up on that or it's not a closed opportunity. We believe that this is an opportunity with, which is intact, but just shifted at this point in time. And as payers and as markets outside of the uh, commercial channels open up, we will look at that also driving growth into calendar 24. So uh, that's where we uh, are in terms of where we see this growing from the base that we exited last fiscal. Yeah, sir. Got it. Uh, thank you and uh, happy Diwali to you and the team. And the best happy of Diwali, Yash. Thank you, Yash. Uh, We'll take the next question from Surya Patra. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my first question is about the like-to-like uh, -like growth that we would be seeing in the uh, biosimilars uh, operation. Uh, so, in fact, uh, uh, the specific question is that uh, uh, we are we have seen a kind of a good ramp up and good adoption of uh, uh, our biosimilar by payers in the recent period, and also the integration has uh, provided some kind of uh, uh, additional foothold uh, uh, in the U.S. market, and simultaneously we have seen some kind of or incremental pricing pressure for the biosimilar. So uh, net net. Uh, if we see, we have uh, YOI basis has almost doubled in terms of uh, reportable re revenues in the biosimilar business. But uh, is it possible to share what is the like-to-like -like growth that we would have seen? And, uh, uh, and the extension to that is that, see whether we are doing better in the non-US market compared to the US market at the current juncture, if you can share that. Yes, I think again to you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, Surya, I think uh, one of the things that we've not done so far is give product by product detail. So that's something that we've not disclosed at this point. I think one of the things when we look at better, 
over last year. And we see almost all geographies performing better over last year. Uh, we've put out the major geographies in the US and uh, EU by product. And, and we've shown that growth in terms of how we've performed over last year. So I think it's it's been uh, it's been a very clear pattern that in the US, all products have performed well. And we are seeing that growth across uh, uh, the, the EU as well. So we are seeing that move up. Uh, price erosion, as I've said, even in the past is... Is a is a is an outcome of competition. So that's something that you will continue to see, and that's where uh, volume growth is extremely important. So these market shares have come at uh, at a at a stage where we've looked at preserving ASP. So we haven't gone chasing market share um, at at a crazy ASP. So we've been able to conserve preserve value and and build those market shares in a in a very steady measured manner. So it's grown over time in a profitable way as we've offset the price erosion that, that's happened over the course uh, of time. Uh, but to go and look at every product uh, by geography, uh, that I don't think we've shared those details so far. Okay. Uh, my, in fact, uh, the basic point I was trying to draw from my question is that, uh, see, the spend on the US biosimilar is obviously uh, significantly higher uh, compared to the emerging market. Basically, we are utilizing the same dojo for the other market, non-US market. And uh, non-US market, it seems, grows better uh, or growing better than the US market at the current juncture uh, because of uh, branded play and all that. So my sense is that, see, unless until we cover up mm, the R&D spend, uh, the incremental R&D spend after the integration of a Viatris operation, what we have seen from the incremental US revenue, we may not see much ramp up in the or improvement in the margin profile. So, so that is why I was trying to assess that whether the the current performance has been supported by the non-US market, which is branded business growing relatively better compared to US. But uh, US possibly will see the ramp up only after the commercialization of the pipeline products. Jiri, do you have any additional color for Surya in terms of the margin profile by region? Uh, so, hi, Surya. We don't disclose margin by, by geography or product, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, my next question is on the uh, the the large Medicare uh, uh, or uh, payers that we have uh, seen as a or the large Medicare payers that those who have adopted our products in the recent period. So with that, uh, what is the kind of uh, theoretical uh, market share that we can see for our uh, glycine as well as Aceptin? Matt, you want to go ahead with that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it, Shriyas, and then I'll pass it over. Look, as I think what this demonstrates is good demand for Biocon Biologics products. As we bring on these new payers, certainly we'll, we are looking for that market share increase, and we anticipate that. But right now, to say exact numbers, it's early. All we know is what uh, Peter had highlighted in his opening comments is that we have one, two significant uh, payers uh, that will be starting at the first of the year or have started uh, that will be a, a nice contributor to our insulin franchise. And then also we continue to see additional traction. And this is what we're excited about in North America, additional traction in our uh, trastuzumab, in our peg filgrastin, as we continue to win those payer awards, as well as adding new ones. And then we've also seen, as Peter said in his open comments, uh, some nice wins in regards to our adalidumab uh, and our Julio. So uh, to say exactly what those market shares will be, uh, it would be hard to project, but we are anticipating that growth because the additional wins and the demand for our products across the board, whether that be in our insulin or oncology or even in our immunology. So I think it shows and demonstrates 
as Peter and Shreya shared, as we're cutting over, um, and we say this, and I've said it before, biosimilars is not just what we do, it's all we do. And I think that's really the focus that allows us to continue to see this progression, as well as our, our manufacturing and our uh, vertical integration to continue to compete. Lastly, I'll say across our products and why I think we continue to see this uptake is that They come back in, but we are dedicated to the market. And I think that shows in our uh, our value to our customers and also the ability to maintain the products that are needed uh, for patients that uh, rely on all of our products and our commitment uh, to the market, both in North America and Europe, as you can see, market share continues to increase there. Sure, so just with your permission, one last question from my side related to the regulatory compliance related development. So uh, my sense is that uh, insulin as part possibly was the, the low hanging fruit on that, on that regulatory compliance or advancement front. Uh, and uh, subsequently we were thinking about uh, the uh, Beva Sizumab uh, link to the Bangalore site. So is it fair to believe, uh, so with the CRL what we have achieved for uh, uh, now Malaysia site. So the development of uh, uh, this Beva system app uh, and, uh, and the related, the plant related development regulatory in the Bangalore site will only happen post Malaysia plants clearance or both are happening parallelly. Surya, let me respond to that question. The Asphalt uh, CRL is an independent issue from uh, the current status that we have uh, with the FDA at this point in time. The Asphalt CRL uh, is an outcome of the inspection that we received in uh, August, September of last year. And um, they, they had already accepted our uh, CAPA. They found it to be adequate. And they had written to us that they would need to verify the completeness and the effectiveness of those CAPAs when they uh, do that in a follow-on uh, pre-approval inspection. That inspection was to happen before the goal date in October of this year. That pre-approval inspection was not scheduled. So the ASPOT PI okay. is linked to us having that uh, inspection yet, which has not been scheduled. The, um, the status in Malaysia is linked to the surveillance GMP inspection which was scheduled for products approved and commercial, which was not related to ASPART at all. So these are two delinked activities. And as far as India site is concerned, we continue to supply the commercial products. The pre-approval inspection is for Bevacizumab for additional capacity and uh, for Traskizumab. So those are different requirements. And at this point, we await that inspection which is scheduled for Q4 of this fiscal year. Um, obviously, when whenever you have a, a, a regulatory observation, you want to make sure that globally all your sites and all your networks benefit from whatever actions you take. And, and our quality team uh, led by Michael and then our chief operating officer, Rhonda, was also on the call. We put in place a very comprehensive program to make sure that we've uh, you know, implemented these practices so that the agency continues to see the uh, upgrades that we've made on our quality maturity journey that we, we have been on. Clearly, it's a step up in terms of what we are looking to do. And, um, and that's a process that uh, that's a part of our business, which we continue to invest in. Sure, sir. Thank you. Wish you happy Diwali to the entire team. Happy Diwali, Surya. Thanks, Surya. Uh, we have the next question from Janine Shah from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is on Aflibercept. Um, so is there an update on the litigation? And if all goes well, uh, when is the earliest we can launch this product? So, Daniel, as we've said in the past, uh, the the litigation update is uh, is what is as we've shared in the past. We 
do not have any further update. The trial is completed. And uh, at this point, we await uh, the decision uh, from the judge to see what the next steps could be. That's where we are on Applebur. So in terms of launch date, I think at this point, since we are in a in an IP litigation, it wouldn't be fair to comment on, on what that would be. Sure. And um, at the time of acquisition, um, you know, there were certain deferred payments uh, to be made in FI25. So um, is it linked to any milestone, uh, you know, and what is the quantum payable and how do we plan to pay that? Those are not, uh, I don't think there's any milestone. Gini, is there any milestone linked to this? Not not to my knowledge, Jamie. Okay, so it, but it is payable in FI25, right? That's correct. Right, Chini? Yes, it is payable in FI25. And we'll be paying from our internal accruals or we'll be raising uh, uh, money for that? Uh, combination, we are looking at, uh, we have different ways to pay down the uh, deferred payments. Largely, yes, internal growth. And we could have some other fund flows that we're planning for. Okay. And um, just on the filing status, um, uh, so we were, we, we were supposed to file uh, Stellara by this year and uh, Denozuma by next year and Humira interchangeability. I think the, uh, so uh, the, how, how are the trials progressing? So, Daniel, uh, just happy to share with you that we are on track for both Ustakinumab, which is in, you know, before the end of this year, and for Dinosumab also end of next year. So that stays on track, and we have passed the trial, but we, of course, talk about it only once the applications are made and the dossiers are submitted and accepted by the agency. Okay, okay. That's all from my side. Thank you, and happy to have you. Have a good one. Thanks, Janil. Uh, we'll take the next question from Nithya Balasubramanian from Bernstein. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, first question is on Glargene. Uh, you had alluded to two new payers now adding Glargene in their formulary. If you can tell us what number of commercial lives, or I'm assuming it's commercial, but what number of uh, lives that, that it represents. Yeah, I, I would say at this point, uh, so hopefully you can hear me. Sorry. Um, this point, this remains uh, confidential uh, on these lives, uh, but I can tell you they are large payers and why it remains confidential. We're still on track uh, to be able to announce this. Uh, but at this point, uh, we are not disclosing that. Understood. Uh, you had spoken about a managed care organization where you were expecting to see better traction in insulin glargine this year. Uh, however, if I look at the data, I'm actually seeing slight slippage in market share. So what's happening there? Why haven't we seen that progress? Yeah, Shriyas, would you like me to, to answer? Yeah, yeah, I think please go ahead. Okay, yeah, some of this, uh, the IQV data, there are some large payers, um, uh, closed door networks that don't report. So you're seeing some quarter over quarter uh buying patterns, but you're not seeing the full picture because of the way folks in IQVIA report or don't report. Um, but we continue to, as Shreya said, maintain that mid to high teens. And I think with the new uh, large payers coming on board, uh, that definitely will be uh, something we'll be able to hit that target with. Just one thing to add, Nitya, to what Matt said, when you have a closed uh, door network, uh, like Peter referred to also in his opening remark, when they do not report in the IQVIA data, one of the good things about this is the it's an exclusive channel, which uh, which also sees a very high degree of conversion uh, to the brand. So it, it straight away comes to assembly or, or insulin glargine with an over 90, 95% conversion in a, in a quarter's period. Uh, how do you see the adoption of GLP-1s impacting insulin volumes? Do you see that as a mid-term to long, mid to long-term threat? We see this as uh, at this stage, and again, this is um, just to be qualified appropriately. But we see this as complementary treatments, things that will coexist over a period of time, and 
Um, I will defer to Peter. Peter, if you would want to give an overarching view on, on GLP-1s and, and insulins together. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think you state the nature of the answer, Sri Has. I mean, I think it, they would be complementary. Insulins would be obviously for type 1 diabetes. GLPs would be more to the type 2. And of course, beyond that, the weight loss opportunity. And this talks to uh, you know, the investments that we're making in the generics business in building a peptides, a peptides technology capability and capacity to take advantage of, of what could be a, you know, a very, very strategic peptide opportunity with GLPs at the center. Analyst estimates of what the loss of exclusivity for GLPs could look like over the next 10 years you know, hover around the $100 billion mark. So that's a very big opportunity for the generics business and very complementary to the to the biologics business with insulins. Got it, thanks. And if I may, uh, any updates on your interchangeable interchangeability study for Adalimumab? Uh, when might you be expected to file the product? Uh, and uh, for Stellara, again, would you again be going after interchangeability? We know that Appear has now now has an interchangeable designation for their biosimilar. So two things uh, on the Adalimumab study, we've already said it's underway, and we should we should have the outcome to discuss in the coming calendar. So that's one. On the Stellara piece, we 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 feel quite quite confident on the interchangeability discussions. We're starting to see that. Uh, come through the agency believes that that can happen and and we feel very strongly about that and from our product for our product as well uh sorry Shrihas, do you mean an interchangeability designation for stellara without doing a switching study or so we don't want to disclose the specifics of our strategy but we feel good about our how our interchangeability should work thank you so much thanks Nitya. thanks Nitya. Uh, the next question is from Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening and thank you for taking my question. Uh, just want to reflect on the last 12 months from a Biocon biosimilar perspective. Um, I remember when we were talking about the acquisition or even in the first quarter of the acquisition, we were talking about this billion dollar run rate. Uh, we are talking about the same billion dollar run rate for this fiscal as well. Uh, so just want to understand, you know, has some of those pieces, which are the pieces that we think they did not materialize for us to see growth over a 12 or a 15 month period, I'm, uh, right? And underlying profitability for the business, I remember at that time uh, was roughly 25% is what was, uh, you know, kind of thought of, and I'm including R&D, not looking at core EBITDA or something. Uh, net debt EBITDA, at that time, uh, you know, it's probably looks like now closer to between four and five. Uh, what are the plans for us? If you remember, uh, as cash flows get generated, we wanted to pay down debt. So just the overall piece of doing the transaction at that point of time and 12 months out, how does it look? And which are the pieces that are probably not working, maybe which are working? Let me take it, Peter, is it okay? Yeah, yeah please do, Shri yes, I comment at the end. Okay, Sham, I think that's a that's a very a very fair question in terms of where it is. And I think you're right. Some things have worked well for us and some some things have not uh, gone well. And it's not just gone well for us, probably not gone well even from an industry perspective. So more like a class effect. From what's gone well, we've talked about it, where we've seen that of the base that we came off uh, from last quarter, last year, we've been able to do what's in our direct control where we've been able to gain market share as we've uh, we've transitioned that business sooner than what was there so we have we are more in control of our destiny than before so in terms of value more than 50% of the value of the business is now transitioned to biocon biologics so these are all the good things uh, that's allowed us to gain control of it so it uh, you know things like what surprised us and what didn't go well in terms of the legacy contracts that led uh, to to rebates, which uh, which we had to accommodate in the PNL, some of it which hit us in a big way, in you know from a quarterly perspective, uh, we have a better control on that now. The growth drivers uh, that we looked at 
have certainly differed. So what didn't work very well has been the Julio launch, which we expected on July 1. We were able to launch the product as planned, but from an entire industry segment itself, no, none of the biosimilars have been able to win market share in 2023. Uh, and I think that's something that's uh, uh, to be looked at because the opportunity moves and remains intact at this point in time. But we have some work to do because we've taken over the business post the launch. Uh, but we will, you know, our teams are working and engaging with customers to see how we can get into formularies because that's an area that we haven't been successful yet. So clearly we are doing that for the commercial formulary. As part is something that uh, has indeed surprised us. The, uh, the pre-approval inspection, we, we believe that, uh, you know, we have a very strong quality management uh, system in place. Uh, but of course, you know, given that we've got approvals in, in almost every other geography, but um, we still have to win the confidence of the FDA. And at this point, that's the process. Uh, and we are just going to be working to see how we can win credibility with the agency. We have approvals with EMA, with Health Canada, TSA, uh, and Visa, Cofepris, you name the agency. But I think what's not gone well for us yet is that we haven't been able to get across the line from the from an FDA perspective. And that's something that uh, that I can tell you our entire leadership is focused on, and we should see success sooner than later because of the efforts that we are putting in and the discussions we've had. So I think if you do a, a, a full swat of it, there are things that have gone in our favor, and there are things that we could have done better. But the important thing is that these are opportunities which have shifted, and we believe they're still to be realized in the coming quarters. But I'll pause and I'll, I'll see Peter if you wanted to add something to that. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Sri Hans. I think the only thing that I would add, because I think you've given a very comprehensive answer, is, is the progress made in the transition, as Sri Hans alluded to. We, we have not yet got our hands around 50% of the business, uh, only just in, in the United States. So it's not steady state. We're going through a complex transition, um, uh, you know, and we're doing it in a, a accelerated, shortened period of time. And there are a lot of things that we need to do. Shri has alluded to very many of them. And uh, again, I think the entire team is focused on uh, you know, navigating through the transition, getting our hands around the full business and our hands on the steering wheel. Uh, you know, once that integration is complete and we've consolidated, as, as I think many of the questions have provided uh, pointers to, we see a very healthy growth future ahead, driven you know, by the market share gains where we've got into commercial products. Of course, those are offset to some extent by price declines but by a very healthy pipeline that once we get through the FDA discussions, uh, you know, all go well for the future. So it's it's not, I think, uh, the right way to look at this as steady state at this point in time. I think another two quarters and we'll, we'll really have gone through the integration and consolidated and then, you know, then we'll be steady state and have, have the kind of trajectory that, that we're looking at. Got it. Very helpful. Uh, just a second question to uh, Siddharth on the generic piece, right? I think API business, I think you mentioned there were pricing pressures, uh, muted growth. I, I think one product where you have taken, uh, you know, a pause perhaps. So just want to understand what's happening there. We earlier had some guidance for generics, but looks like we've not mentioned anything except that 2H will be better. So just that color on both API and formulations. Thank you. Thanks, Sham. Uh, yes, we've uh, had a H1 growth of 9% uh, <clears throat> in the generics business. Uh, in quarter two specifically, we have uh, also seen a very good growth on the formulations business, uh, which, which continues to perform well. We continue to gain market share on statins, and we also expect to launch a couple of new products, and that's what is going to probably drive the growth in the coming quarters. Uh, of course, it will take some time uh, before we see a this 200 crore odd number per quarter that we are clocking in uh, uh, in the formulations business go up significantly. But on the API business, uh, the, the reasons you mentioned, if we have uh, one of the plants which underwent a planned shutdown um, 
and hence uh, there were capacities uh, that uh, we could not manufacture and we expect to cater to that customer's demand in the coming quarter. So it's just moved to the next quarter. And uh, But at a macro level, when I look at, there has been an impact uh, seen as a result of the pricing uh, pressure that uh, some of our customers have faced and either they've asked for m much lower prices, uh, which, which we are not able to cater to uh, those demands at that price or our customers in certain cases have lost the business that they had with their customers, their end customers, and uh, which has led to lower offtake. Uh, directionally, I do not see a huge uh, change for the kind of products we have, the general size products uh, in the coming quarters. Of course, a lot would depend on uh, as in when we launch uh, new products, uh, especially the peptides in the coming quarters. And that's where we'll see a uh, growth uh, kicking in to that mid-teens uh, level in FI25. So for H2, just to reiterate, H2 will be better than H1. Uh, we will see a steady performance of formulations at the level at, uh, which we had in H1, which is uh, around 400 crores. And uh, H2 uh, API business should pick up compared to H1, but on an overall basis, the guidance that I had given last year of mid-teens um, might be more titrated down to low teens to high single digit. Got it. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Shram. We have the next question from uh, Mr. Rumail Dahiya, a retail investor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Paliwal, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I speak as a, an investor, a long-term investor in Biocon, and with a large number of concerns to share. Um, I have been um, social on social media, I have been interacting with the chairperson. She has very kindly been replying also from time to time, also with your investor relations team. But I thought uh, the concerns are still not addressed. Um, uh, I thought they would have been addressed in the presentation by uh, Mr. Baines, but no, they were not. So I thought, let me just bring them up front. And I have a couple of questions. I'm sure you'll uh, accommodate me for this. Uh, my first question is, has there been a, a, an analysis, uh, the cost benefit analysis, or let's say uh, the opportunity cost that we have lost because of uh, poor inspection record particularly in our uh, Zohar Baru uh, plant? Uh, and has there been anybody held responsible uh, for that loss that has been caused because of poor things like uh, sterile, sterile uh, seizures not being there or, uh, or an exhaust pipe being blocked and things of this nature? If we take pride in, uh, in quality consciousness and quality readiness, how can we have such things and repeatedly, you know, multiple observations, then CRLs, then official action in, uh, indicated, how can we happen? How can that happen? And what are we going to do about it? And whom are you going to hold accountable for this? And what is the total loss that that would have occurred, opportunity uh, cost that we have had to incur? That's my first question. Uh, um, I'll happily start that others may want to contribute thank you very much for the question mr dahia um let me start by saying that the the Bicon group has you know a long a strong and a very proud track record in terms of quality and compliance and uh you know you can see that in very very many dimensions including some of the comments made on the call today with fda approvals um, you know, and of course, the the CRL in Malaysia, um, Sri Hass has explained the background to that and the, the current situation in which we are actively in a, in a very focused manner engaged with the agency. Sri Hass has said that the next meeting is scheduled for the Q4 uh, this fiscal year, and we can update then. I think it's also entirely reasonable to pull the lens out a little bit and look at the wider picture. And, you know, the the FDA, uh, you know, um, in terms of, uh, you know, post-COVID activity, the, the, the bar on quality 
has, has been lifted a little bit. And, you know, we, we do not have any fundamental issues there. We've described the nature of the findings in Malaysia to you related to ASPART in, in this call, um, you know, and we're working expeditiously to resolve them. Again, as Sri has, has alluded to, any learnings that we gain from this exercise will be cross-fertilized across the entire network. Um, and we will be looking at doing that to ensure that, you know, going forward, we're, we're ready, uh, um, you know, and, and compliant across the lessons learned from there in all our sites and to further build, I think, the very proud reputation that, that the company has in terms of agency in inspections. Shriyas, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thanks, Peter. And uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Daya, for your question and for your long-term association with the company and your, your belief in us. I think we share your frustration um, uh, to a large degree because there are uh, you know, uh, situations where, despite efforts, we are not able to move past the FDA hurdle, like I said, at this point in time. We've had an exceptional track record with global regulators. So I just want to balance that. And this is not to justify that, that we haven't been able to work across the FDA right now. There is, of course, a, a heightened expectation of the biologics facility and, and, uh, and picking out a particular observation and discussing it would be uh, a little challenging. But I think it's important to note that we've been able to work with, um, with global regulators been able to show them what are the developments and improvements that we made across our facilities, across the network. But as I said, the, it is not enough at this point in time. There is effort ongoing to make sure that, that we can work with the expectations that FDA has. And I'm very confident that the team that we've put together uh, and we have them on the call uh, and the efforts that have gone in into putting this together will yield results and success. So. It is a matter of time, I believe, when we will start seeing the results of this effort that are going in. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, and, and I'm glad that there is an acceptance uh, of the need to do more. Uh, now, my second question is uh, about uh, uh, a deep discomfort uh, as far as the shareholders are concerned. Now, uh, Mr. Tambi, uh, mentioned about uh, more control of destiny uh, of its own country, but probably the shareholders of Biocon uh, do not have uh, the control over their own destiny. Um, uh, people like me have lost 40% of their investments over the last four year, three years uh, uh, and, and sit on large, uh, huge losses uh, because the share prices haven't moved up. I remember in one of the meetings last time, chairperson said, uh, we can do nothing about the share prices, but must. But uh, I think it's a listed company, and uh, the management uh, has to be responsible for it and answerable to the shareholders for for bringing down their value. We seem to be the only people whose whose concerns are not being taken care of. Uh, every time I hear uh, strong growth, uh, very st uh, growth in EBITDA. But what matters and what investors uh, are more concerned about is net profit. And net profitability percentages have been low. Even in this quarter where one expected things would be better, the net profit is only 4.6% of, uh, of, of the revenue, which is low by industry standards and, and uh, the companies of this nature. May I know if, if, if this uh, the, the agony of the shareholders has concerns the management at all? And if yes, what are they going to do about it? And when when are things likely to uh, improve going forward? Sure. Let me start again, uh, Mr. Dahia. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the, the management are uh, concerned about shareholders' concerns and the feedback that we get. Our job is to build our business, uh, you know, in a, in a profitable manner. And, and to play in, into the market and the markets will ultimately set price. But that's not an abrogation of responsibility. I can assure you that everyone in the Biocon group is working extremely hard to drive the profitable growth in the business models that we're engaging in. 
I mean, quite clearly, uh, we we are in the in the midst of a transformational um, initiative with the biologics business, and I think, as I alluded to before, we're not yet at steady state. Uh, quite clearly, the research services business has continued to grow very profitably, as has the generics business. But when you take on an undertaking of this global nature and transform the business into very much a top tier global integrated operation, it does take a little bit of time. Uh, we, you know, we've accelerated that timeline and we're making very good progress. And of course, we recognize that we have a lot more to do and you've put your finger on several of those areas. And I think Sri Hassan has, has uh, very comprehensively described what we're looking at, what we're doing, and the timelines on the regulatory front, as he has on many other aspects of drivers for growth. So we are extremely focused on um, you know, building a, a, a profitable and growing company. Um, um, but, but right now, we're in the middle of this transformational shift, and the steady state, as I alluded to, I think is a couple of quarters away. Thank you. Uh although it does does provide hardly any comfort uh, and 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 the ball is uh, you know just kicked to the next quarters uh, but that notwithstanding uh, simple things like uh, foreign uh, exchange losses uh, i mean the company hedges foreign exchange but four out of five times at least it makes losses in foreign exchange this thing is there a lack of understanding of the dynamics of foreign exchange or is there less of effort being put into that or what? That's number one part of this particular question. And second part is that are we not, are, what are we doing to control our expenditure? I think our expenditure is too much. There's, there's, so as a result of which, the, obviously the net profit will go down. Uh, are we, have we, have we uh, bitten more than what we can chew? Have we done have you taken on far too many things uh, uh, on which a lot of expenditure is incurred simultaneously without consolidating? Has Is there any thought about managing the finances? Uh, uh, is there any plan, please? Maybe um, Shri Has, you or Chini or Sid, you want to address the hedging question, um, and then we can come back and talk a little bit more about cost control. Yeah, and I think we should uh, we should look at that uh, data in terms of the foreign exchange. Maybe I think it's best to look at the uh, the data with Indranil and Chidi and maybe see what, what is the reference at a BL level overall, what is the comment uh, that Mr. Daya has and and what is the reference? So we can we can address it with facts, and then we'll of course certainly address your comment, uh, Mr. Daya, in terms of oh, how are we looking at uh, looking at this, and what kind of a transformation we are on. Because when you are looking at these kind of transformational opportunities, which are once in a lifetime, I think it does take a, a, a bit of uh, time to get this ongoing and and, and firing in the way you want. So uh, yes, I can understand that there is frustration along the way. So I completely appreciate what you're trying to say, uh, but let's get the facts first on the forex, and then we will address that concern if it's okay with you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Indranil Chini, do you have uh, anything on the forex, and then we can move on? Yeah, I think we need to present that as a group, uh, combined uh, gain or loss, and we will clarify that. We can also do this with you, Mr. Daya, offline with uh, with our finance team, just so that you get the facts proper. Because we can we can look at data and then and see where we are on the on the policy. I can I can tell you our finance team looked at this very closely, and um, and we will we will look at the concern that you've raised and and see how best we can respond to your concern. Thank you. I was just saying that you know if you're hedging, you're spending some money on hedging and still making losses. Is it worthwhile hedging thereafter? We should. We might as well not do hedging, and then then bear the uh, take take on the profit or loss, whatever it comes. So why are we suffering losses on both counts, paying fees and yet suffering losses? That was my main concern. So obviously, yeah. 
sorry, I'll just clarify. So really, the I mean, whatever gain losses includes the hedging cost, we've largely seen gains play out. But there are some uh, uh, things on our books, particularly the Goldman Sachs investment, which keeps getting retranslated. These are pro products you can't hedge. And that reflects as a book loss, but that's not a cash loss. Largely, mm -hmm. we've seen robust forex management and gains mm -hmm. flowing through from. So, so what, and what maybe the, Shivaji can also add that because there is also a large component of loss coming from Sinji. So Shivaji, maybe you can give a context there. Sure, uh, say thank you. Um, so Mr. Dahiya, we uh, hedge to manage risk forward. So if you look at Sinjin's hedging losses and gains, uh, in 2020, financial year 21 and 22, we had hedging gains simply because the rupee did not depreciate and the banks were giving higher forward rates. The case has been different in the last two years, uh, in 22, 23, and now in 24 also, because, uh, for example, in Sinjin, our hedge rate was 81. The current rate is 83. So we are booking hedge losses. However, what why we hedge? Because it's a policy, because you have to bring certainty and don't leave, want to leave our top line and the uh, profit number exposed to uncertainties coming out of the Forex market. We do that. Having said that, you know, uh, whenever we have a hedge loss, we have an equivalent higher revenue uh, over there. Because if our, for example, the rate is 83, our revenues will be higher. So we'll book a higher gain in Forex on the revenue line and we have a hedge loss on the expense line, the profit impact is neutral. So it's, it's more optics and it brings certainty to the you know, financials. Uh, uh, and that's why the hedging policy is over there. So I can assure you there is generally very little profit impact and cash impact coming out of hedging, but it provides uh, firmness and certainty. Thank you. Yeah, and also at a group level, just to, uh, I think one of your questions was that do we pay uh, cost to get these hedges so as a group policy directionally i think most of our hedges uh, are are range forwards or forwards where we do not pay cash to acquire these contracts and just at a at an h1 level uh, just for three businesses the generics business is largely forex neutral this year so far and like uh, chini mentioned there is a certain instrument in biocon biologics it is getting notionally restated and there is no cash loss, but there is a restatement effect, which is why you see that loss. And the third aspect is on the research business, which my colleague uh, Shibaji just clarified. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, the question about uh, are we, how do we manage the expenditures? Uh, what are we doing about that so that our net profits increase? This is uh, this is an open question in terms of how we are looking to control costs, and I think that is uh, signified in terms of, and we can respond to this as three different companies as well. But I, let me respond on Biocon Biologics to you, Mr. Daya, and I think one of the key indicators of how your the business is performing and the health of the business, if you leave aside all these exceptions that we've been discussing, is to look at the core performance of the business or what we're looking at as core EBITDA, where you've taken out all of these uh, one-time things and say, okay, if this is what I'm operating, what is the gross profit I make? What are the staff costs that are included? And what is it that I see as my margins? And if you look at that, that's always been in that mid thirties, regardless of where we've been. And that is clearly very, very uh, comfortable. It is better than most other peers in the Indian pharma group. Now, this is not to signal to say that we are you know, the best, but this is something we've been consistent about and we have been staying to that uh, extent. We do invest a significant portion of our revenues in R&D because as you know, that's our lifeline as, uh, as Kiran has been saying all along. And that is something that uh, is higher than most of our industry peers, which has been usually around that six, seven percent range. We've been in the past up to 14 uh, percent as well. Uh, so we've capped that at around 11 to 12 percent. So that brings our EBITDA margins, which is at this transformational stage, a reflection of, of what the business is doing. Even if you take the 
uh, investments in R and D, which is at that mid twenties. Uh, now that's remained more or less consistent and a true reflection, really, of the health of the business, as long as you accommodate for these transformational costs, which will be more uh, uh, transitionary in nature until you settle down and get to a steady state that we were talking about. Uh, we do expect to get to a steady state. Uh, there are, of course, these uh, pluses and minuses that I was responding to earlier when Sham asked that question. We are fully aware of what uh, has worked, what hasn't worked, and we will make sure that uh, you know these things even out over time. But I think at this stage, you know, like you've been patient and long standing with us, I think what is really required is is to have that patience to play this out, and we believe that uh, you know going forward this will play out the way we've all uh, expecting it to. Fine. My final question then, uh, you know. Mr. Dai, if, if, I, if I may, because we're running out, we're on the hour and about to close. Um, uh, we'd be very happy to pick this, to pick your questions up offline. Um, okay. Uh, okay. If, if with your permission, I propose that we do that. I hope we've answered some of your questions. You clearly have more. We'd be happy to pick them offline as pick them up offline, as I've said. Uh, with your permission, I'll then hand over to Sarah to close the call. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, was the last question. Uh, for any further clarifications or questions, uh, you know, please do get in touch with us. Uh, and Kunja are available uh, to answer any of the follow-ups which we have been missed today. With this, uh, I wish you all a happy Dhanteras and wish you all a very happy Diwali and a prosperous new year ahead. Have a good night.